Good afternoon. This is a podcast runs through it. Coming to you from Livingston, Montana, Sound Color Studios, where we're surrounded by art and music, and now we're trying to do politics. <laughs> uh, I'm here today. I'm Nelson King uh, with Dixie Hart. Good afternoon. And we have an interesting interview coming up. We are going to be talking to the people from uh, Montana Conservation Voters, MCV. And uh, we'll be talking to uh, Whitney and Aaron, who are here um, to represent what, what they do, trying to get people to vote and vote for conservation, which is a big issue here in Montana. Uh, as I'm talking... Uh, we're at the very beginning, I guess you could say, of the coronavirus. Uh, well, we, we we really don't know if we're at the beginning because we still haven't done very much testing in this country. So No, and we have yeah. only one case here in Montana, as I speak, um, and that's kind of a weird one. So w- It's not actually physically in Montana. Yeah. Well, and their home is somewhere up near uh, Judith Gap, which is, I thought, kind of interesting. Right. But any case... Uh, that's our context, and it feels kind of strange talking about politics and many other things, that issues which at the moment seem to be secondary to what's going on with coronavirus and the pandemic and the pandemic and, and what it will do to the economy. Crash. Uh, nevertheless, yeah. life goes on. Right. This is pretty and serious. there are other issues, and I think today we'll be talking a lot about uh, land issues, land use issues, and conservation climate change. This should be a very interesting session. I'm uh, hoping you'll stick with us. And uh, without further discussion, let's get on to the interview. Remember to wash your hands. Good afternoon. This is a podcast runs through it. And today we're going to be talking from with two representatives uh, of the Montana Conservation Voters, MCV for short. And uh, we're going to be talking to Whitney Tani, who is your... Um, the deputy director. Deputy director, I thought so, yeah. Yep. And Aaron Murphy, who's the executive director. And uh, we want to explore with you a little bit about not only what you do, but in the current context, you know, politically, environmentally, uh, the elections... <laughs> I suppose we won't talk about the coronavirus, but we'll pretty much everything else (laughs) and uh, give you a chance to explain what your organization is trying to do and what you personally do and your backgrounds a little bit. So we can just, why don't we start there? You know, how did you get into this and what, and weave that into the story of what Montana Conservation Voters does? And I mean, the name says quite a bit, but. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Nelson. And, and, um, uh, exciting to be here. We are big fans of the show, and uh, um, by the way, really cool studio, so it's an honor to be in here. Uh, Montana Conservation Voters has been around since 1999, so last year we celebrated our 20th birthday, um, and the the reason that I was drawn to it after working um, for Senator John Tester was the fact that it is a very important blend of the pol- politics, the political landscape, and our natural landscape, and how those two merge, and that you need to elect champions who are champions of our clean water, clean air, public lands, uh, and win those elections in order to see real progress. So uh, at MCV, we we actually are a cluster of several organizations. Uh, we have a 501c4, which is our Montana Conservation Voters. We have uh, our Montana Conservation Voters Education Fund, which is a 501c3 organization. And then we have uh, two political action committees, which um, get involved into federal and state races. So that's the MCV Action Fund and the MCV Congressional Action Fund. So all four of those work together to do what we do. Yeah, brief explanation for those people who don't know about it. The 501c3, c4, it basically separates those that are working as a nonprofit and do not involve themselves in political activity Correct. and then those that do. And Correct. you can could do both with your organization. Exactly right. And we were very careful to separate both. Uh, so, for example, we uh, our education fund is very focused on educating and civic engagement, making sure people are educated about issues um, and involved. And with our 501c4, that's where we... Um, uh, hold elected decision makers accountable for their decisions at every level of government, and um, uh, I think that's what we do best. Now that seems to be a 
a deciding characteristic. You're not only advocating for particular issues and particular conservation projects, but you also have a political agenda, so to speak. You're right. watching the, you know, the politicians for what they say and what they do, which is not always the same. <laughs> <laughs> and getting behind them. Uh, mm -hmm. We endorsed uh, several candidates already, uh, and we expect uh, uh, more to be coming soon. Um, uh, so we have endorsed Governor uh, Steve Bullock in his run for U.S. Senate. Um, just a few weeks before that, we endorsed uh, several folks who are running for our land board. So these are the statewide office holders who um, all make up our, our land board. They make right, decisions yeah. about our state-owned land. So we uh, endorsed uh, Senator Bryce Bennett for Secretary of State, Representative Shane Morjo for Auditor. Um, we've uh, endorsed Melissa Romano for Superintendent of Public Instruction. And then on the federal side, uh, Kathleen Williams because she has already been endorsed by MCV, as has Governor Bullock, by the way, in his previous runs for governor. So, Right. So have you made an endorsement in the attorney general race? Uh, have not at this point. Um, both of the uh, uh, candidates that we consider to be um, advocates of, of conservation are very strong in that regard. Um, you know, and when the time comes, we will invite all candidates, Republican, Democrat. Actually, we've got uh, Libertarian candidates and Green Party candidates now. So all of them will be invited to uh, earn our endorsement, and uh, that might happen after after the primary, though. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, our impression has been that it's a pretty deep, deep slate this year. Um, quite a lot of very talented people running for office. Um, mm. We usually have good people, but I, I don't know. What's your impression? Um, I think that we are seeing a lot of people that want change, and they are ready to finally put their money where their mouth is, I guess, in some ways, which is really exciting. Um, but I also think that we still have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And one thing that, that, that we're really excited about, though, and that in a lot of these races this year is there are so many more young people. And they're not just, it, it's great to have young people, but they're exceptionally qualified. So that's kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, it really is. And one of the things we did um, just a few months ago, for example, in Billings, where I live, uh, we got behind several candidates running for the, um, the city council race. And those are nonpartisan positions, but um, there were several people uh, mostly women um, who were running and are very strong candidates. They were very strong candidates. Uh, several of them are now members of our city council and um, we see a lot of leadership potential in those candidates. So when we get behind somebody at a level like a city council race, well, five or six, seven, maybe 10 years, maybe sooner, uh, maybe that person will be running for governor or U.S. senator at some exactly. point. So we were very, we're paying attention Great to the future. Great place to start, yeah. 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 So you, we've been talking about your political agenda, but behind that, of course, are the issues. And not all specifically conservation, although that's a big, you can use that word freely, I suppose. Um, talk a little bit about how your organization addresses issues. You, you know, how do you decide what issues to deal with? And Because uh, it obviously changes from year to year, um, and it's part of its legislative, but I think that Montana is very unique in the sense that we have over 70% of us that are identifying as conservationists, um, which means people deeply care about these issues. And for us, um, there are, are certain things that rise to the top um, that are pressing and urgent and need to be addressed now. One of those things is climate change. Of course, um, that is something that we're staring down the barrel of right now, but then also our public lands, um, because that's kind of the fabric of what makes us Montanans and the fact that we do have so many public lands here in the state, um, but the, and they're under threat. And then the other piece, of course, is clean water and clean air, because we all want to have a healthy community to live in. Um, and we don't want to look like some of the other states, even in the West, that we're starting to see affected. All right. One of the things that I think is uh, very cool, this is before I even arrived at MCV, but Whitney uh, and our political director, a guy named Jake, uh, spent the entire session inside the Montana Capitol. And um, uh, I think it's worth, worth, worth touting if, Whitney, you could talk about uh, the way that you worked with um, lawmakers at the state to basically uh, push forward an important conservation agenda. Yeah, so it was a big experience for me in the sense that I'd been lobbying federally for a long time and coming home to the state house, it is definitely full of citizen legislature um, and lots of things are happening because we only have 90 days every other year. Um, so 
the education opportunity isn't necessarily the same, but what, what we're really proud of is that um, Montana Conservation Voters runs the Conservation Working Group, which is um, a coalition of 12 plus organizations that works the entire session and every single Monday we decide what issues are popping, um, we're watching all the bills, we're working with the legislators to make sure that their bills, if they're good for conservation, are on that list. But basically we call it our hot list and we pass those out um, at the beginning of the day so that when they hit the floor, they know how to vote. Um, and I think that especially because it is so fast and kind of chaotic, um, without that, we would be in a lot of trouble just because no one has time to read all that stuff and right. everything else. So um, we were really successful. Um, and given that we didn't have necessarily the most friendly legislature this last time around, um, we're also able to count on Governor Steve Bullock to be our backstop for anything that did pass through um, that we were uncomfortable with. So it was Let's good. talk a little bit about that. Um, take an issue. Mm-hmm. And then talk about what problems you typically run into. I mean, I think people are aware that most Montanans are very much conservation oriented. Mm -hmm. But what they say and how they go about showing that can be very different. And of course, they have this split between the development of resources and the preservation of resources. And how do you find that when you work with an issue inside the legislature? Mm -hmm. What happens? Well, I think that it's really about building relationships and making sure that you have the ability to talk to everyone. Um, and I think there are a lot of folks that are in that building that all have different um, opinions on how we can serve for future generations, et cetera. But um, I think being able to talk about the facts um, and have kind of the background information that people are looking for instead of just that surface level is really important. And Nelson, I would add at the federal level, that's something we also pay very close attention to. So um, we, for example, have uh, been holding Senator Steve Daines accountable for uh, his record of on paper and in words saying he supports full funding for our public lands. But at the end of the day, and remember, he is a very powerful member of, of the Senate who serves on the Appropriations Committee, which ultimately controls what we spend on those public lands. Um, he is very good at telling Montanans, look, I support them and getting a lot of credit for that, but then at the end of the day, not necessarily flexing his muscle to get those public lands funded. So that's where we come in, and we hold him accountable to that. And so we um, and we go to great lengths to make sure, fairly, by the way, and we don't do it uh, because of his political party um, or anything like that. It's specifically related to, to an issue. Now, because he is a member of the party that controls the Senate's agenda, we do uh, figure that he's got extra clout, which is true. That's the way it works in the Senate. So we we expect him to do whatever he can to, uh, for example, fully fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund. If he says he wants to do that, we expect him to, to pull some strings to get it to happen because he sits in the position of power to do so. Let's start with the Land and Water Conservation Fund. What is it? Uh, it is a, a federal initiative that has been around for uh about 55 years, um, and it is a very important program. Um, what it does is it collects offshore oil and gas development revenue, so say the Gulf of Mexico, and funnels that money into the interior, so funding public lands. And when I say public lands, it's not just uh, federal public lands, which uh, that, that's a big part of it. It funds conservation easements. It funds uh, acquisitions for lands. Um, but it also funds things like swimming pools and parks and bike trails, um, things that people use when they want to be outside. And uh, it's a very important fund because it doesn't use taxpayer dollars directly. It uses these offshore oil and gas revenues. Um, and it is supposed to be funded every single year with $900 million. Well, ever since this uh, baby was born, it hasn't received that level of funding except for one year. And so we have come in early and said, we expect full funding of this. Um, it is important. It is what Congress has mandated. Um, and I think Congress has uh, 
been pretty loose with the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which we often shorthand to LWCF, uh, in shortchanging it. And just this last year, for example, um, after Senator Dane said he supports full funding, he came in and asked for $600 million. Right. And we said, wait a second, 600 isn't 900. Why did you do that? And if you start not at the full level, you're probably going to end up with half. Well, lo and behold, when the final budget came out, the spending came out, it was for $495 million. So it's a little more than half. Not not what we expect. We expect more, especially since he said it. Um, now, he's made some news recently for getting behind legislation to fully fund it. That's great. Um, Senator John Tester is behind that legislation, too. We fully support that. Um, I would note from a political perspective that the very same day that he announced that legislation was also the same day we got word uh, that he was getting a challenger in his U.S. Senate race. And what we do at MCV is we look at conservation champions who are conservation champions. They do things because things are right, not because it's politically expedient for them. Right. Uh, we think that you don't need to have a very expensive tier A Senate race in order to do the right thing. So while we're happy about that, um, we also want to draw attention to the fact that it looks very political. Um, and in the future, we can't afford stuff like that. Right. So, so you want to set a pattern. Actually. Absolutely. We want $900 million every single year because and, that's what our public lands deserve. And, and that's what yeah. the legislation says, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Right. Yep. And, and we want to make sure they know that they're being held accountable. Exactly. It's also about our economy, right? Because right. Montana is supporting $7 billion in spending here in our state for Every year. outdoor recreation. Yeah. We right. need that money to be able to protect these places. So people actually want to come here and Montana continues to be the crown of the United States as far as our public lands. Right. Well, and, and um, what about the, I just read recently that Trump's 2021 budget proposes yeah. cutting 97%. <laughs> Percent, yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because um, that is uh, another thing that uh, part of our, our efforts to educate people that they understand um, that part of the process of a bill becoming a law is the president of the United States gets to set a, a budget. That is his priorities for uh, the next year. Here's what we should spend. Well, lo and behold, uh, the LWCF got the short end of the stick. $14.7 is all the president of the United States proposed for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Again, Dixie, it was a cut of 